Okay. All right. Fine. Sorry, everyone, just one moment here. Well, good morning again. Um, I'm going to invite Jane uh, to read uh, Hebrews chapter 4 to us, and um, if you want to turn to your Bibles and follow along, that would be great. She's reading from the New International Version. Jane, please. We can't hear. Forgot the switch. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest. And those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about an other day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Father God, thank you for your word. The same word that spoke creation into being, the same word that has acted and spoken throughout history and in our lives. And may we this morning receive your word. Not just the parts that we have no problem with or that we, as our pet project or hobby or 
topic, but may we receive all of your word. May we allow your spirit to speak into our lives. May each of us even now just say, Lord God, come, speak to me, tell me, show me, reveal to me, call me. I want to know you as we've sung. So thank you as we come to your word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you hear me? Good? Okay. Do you want me to put it up a bit this way? Okay. Um, so, because it's been so long, uh, it's been, this is I think six weeks or seven weeks maybe, uh, you may have forgotten that we are reading our way through the Sermon of Hebrews. If you will recall, um, just a brief one here, that Hebrews is a sermon, um, and I use the word sermon because that's really what it would have been in this case. It wasn't even a letter, it was, it's written really as a sermon, written to in a community of Jewish Christ followers. Because of their faith in Jesus, they were experiencing hardship, they were experiencing loss, they were experiencing persecution both at the hands of their fellow Jews who did not believe in Jesus and in the past and increasingly at the hands of the Romans themselves. In fact, it wasn't much longer after this that the persecution by Nero on the Christians in Rome was to take place in a couple of years. And so as, they, as the cost of following Jesus became harder and harder, increased more and more. Some of them were questioning Jesus. They were wondering about whether his, how his words worked out, the promises that he gave them. Why weren't they realizing them in their lives? Why was life so hard? Have you ever thought that way? And they were finding themselves thinking that maybe, maybe life before Jesus wasn't so bad. Maybe Jesus isn't who he said he was. And they were contemplating rejecting him. At least some of them were. And Hebrews is written by a pastor, by someone who knows them well as a sermon, meant to draw them back, to help them understand again, and in even in a deeper way, who Jesus was. Creator, superior to angels, superior to Moses, superior the one who came down to earth, the God of heaven and earth. And, and, and that he is also worth the cost of following. That to follow him was worth it. It's a challenge I think that every generation faces and all of us at various times in our face in different degrees of when life doesn't go as we think it should, and when Jesus doesn't do the things we think he should, we maybe start to question and wonder. Now, the preacher does this in Hebrews by alternating between two kinds of writing as the quote by George Guthrie that I had emailed out yesterday explained. And very simply, I'm going to just see if anyone read it or if anyone remembers, but tell, someone tell me, what are the two kinds of writing that the author of Hebrews does? Exaltation and exhortation. 
Oh, just one second, Jane. Hold on here. No, no, there we go. Exaltation of Jesus and exhortation to, yeah. So um, Jane said exaltation, which is actually a really good word, but the word that needs to be before that is exposition of the exaltation of Jesus. So that's bang on, though. I mean, all that the author is concerned about is that Jesus be exalted, that the people know that he is to be exalted, and he exposits Scripture, the Old Testament, and what it means in order to show that to us. And so in all of Hebrews, the author continually goes back between exposition on one hand, that in order to exalt Jesus, and, and exhortation in order to call the people to Jesus, to trust him, to, to have faith in him with their very lives. So exposition are where he focuses on explaining Jesus. Exhortations are made up of applying the exhortation passages by way of calls and warnings for his listeners to respond to the word of God, along with positive and negative examples. And we are in currently in the middle of a, a lengthy exhortation section. Started in chapter 3, verse 1, and it's going to go through all the way through to chapter 4, verse 13. And at this point in time, I'm going to share the screen, Anna. So two seconds here. There we go. Um, there we go. Excellent. Um, and we have in the middle of chapter of this section, and we are in chapter four, verse one. And the author begins chapter four, verse one, with the word "therefore." In fact, this is a word that is used five times in chapter four, and it it speaks of because of what's been said before. Because of what we've learned so far, now this. And the author wants us to know that his words require a response. He's not just trying to fill up our heads. He's trying to change our life, how we live. The therefore leads us backwards in order that we might go forward. Therefore points to his previous words. So let's just quickly read through part of those words, starting at verse 12 of chapter 3. And remember, he's in the middle of this exhortation, and so he says, See to it, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in withdrawing from the living God. But encourage one another each and every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. For we have become partners with Christ, if we hold firm to the conviction we held at the beginning until the end. So you get a picture right away of the sense of there is struggle, there is hardship happening, and often when it, hardship happens, you find yourself withdrawing and pulling back, and you start to question, you think in your mind, and, and you're cut off from people, and he's saying, listen, you've got to be careful, you've got to watch out for yourself, there's things you can do, you can pray, you read scripture, but he says here he wants to focus on the fact that of our community together as a people of God, that we have a responsibility to each other, to encourage each other, so that we don't give up hope. Just a simple encouragement that way, because how many people with this COVID thing and pandemic thing happening, how many people have you connected with just in simple ways to encourage them? Or have you been encouraged that way? He then continues, as it has been said today, 
Remember, he's quoting from Psalm 95 here. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Was it not all those whom Moses led out of Egypt and with whom he was angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to, whom he, did he, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? So we see they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. We have the example, the negative example of Israel. Remember, that's part of exhortation, is giving negative and positive examples. Here's a negative example of Israel not trusting God because of their unbelief. And with it, the call for us not to be hardened by sin, but to encourage each other each and every day so that we don't become hardened by sin. Therefore, therefore what? While the promise to enter his rest is still open, still available. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient. He is patient with you. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And the author is agreeing with Peter. He is saying, yes, there's a promise here of God to enter his rest, and it's still available. So let us be careful that none of you are bound to have fallen short of it. Now, the word careful here is actually the word fear. It's a word that means to tremble. And I'm going to take us back into Exodus for a little bit um, to help us explore this a bit more in the context of Israel and, and thus help us understand um, a bit of what the author is going at here. Um, when I was in Bible school, I did my Bachelor of Theology and I had to do a major paper, I guess if you want to call it that, as part of that. And um, it was kind of like you could do whatever you wanted to. And um, because I'm a person who gets somewhat anxious and fearful, <laughs> I, I was drawn to the word fear. And I wanted to understand, well, what does that mean? What does the word fear mean? And so I actually did a study on the word fear in all of the Old and New Testament. Um, and thus a paper out of that. But the, the, the one passage that struck me the most as I did my study was a passage found in um, Exodus chapter 20. And if you want to turn there, you can. We're just going to be there for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and Exodus 20, chapter 20 is, is uh, Israel has come to Mount Sinai, and, and, and God has uh, come down on the mountain of Mount Sinai, and Israel is camped at the base, and um, God's presence is there. And it's, there's some very physical manifestations of his presence. And it is there that he gives, of course, the Ten Commandments. And so Exodus 20 talks about the Ten Commandments. And then after the Tenth Commandment is given, we are told in Exodus 20, verse 18, this. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Now here's the interesting part. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Do not fear he says, God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. In essence, Moses was saying, listen, fear so that you do not fear. Or sorry, he's saying, do not fear 
And the way you're not going to fear is by fearing. And it, 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 back then it really struck me, because it, it, the NIV doesn't, tries to interpret it more than what the literal says, but the idea is that on one hand, the people were scared spitless of the presence of God, the manifested presence of God at the mountain, and, and, and they, they, didn't, they couldn't handle it. And Moses comes and says, listen, don't be afraid, don't fear, but fear God. How can you not be afraid and yet fear in an appropriate way? And the answer very simply is by trusting God. God three writes, this word fear that is used both in, in the Septuagint version of Exodus 20, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew, and the word used here in Hebrews, which is what uh, the, the Septuagint is what the Hebrew writers would have read um, the Old Testament from. This word often expresses an appropriate reverence, an awe that stem from mighty acts of God and accompany faith. In other words, as they stood and saw the mighty power of God, the, the majesty of God represented in the, manifested in the mountain, Mount Sinai, they should have been full of awe. Wow. But they didn't need to be filled with scary fear, fear, with the fear of dread. And the reason was, was because this God who was on this mountain, who was manifesting himself on this mountain in, in powerful ways, was a God who had chosen them, was a God who had called them, who was a God who said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And so they didn't, have to, they didn't have to have a literal fear that, that caused them to want to shy away and to run and hide. They instead could have an awesome fear of, wow, I can't believe it. I can't believe that this amazing God, this awesome God has chosen us. So more than just a caution, what, it, what they're saying is this word communicates an emotional state in which one reflects upon the awesome dimensions of God's power. I get glimpses of that every so often as God works and does things in my life that I feel are, uh, that are important to me. Sometimes there'll be times in my life where it seems like really, things are really hard. And then he, he, he does something that just lets me know that he is with me, that he is present, that he cares. Which is why, by the way, the author says, encourage one another. Because sometimes... We can go period through periods where we don't hear the, the voice of God, the, the presence of God. And by others, people sharing and, and encouraging us, then, then we can hold on and know that, that He is God, that He is good, that He loves us, that He has called us. That there is still hope. Yes, life is hard. I am sorry, Christ, the, the, the prosperity gospel's got it wrong in this sense. Following Christ is not easy. Following Christ is not about living life now, your best life now. Following Christ is about eternity. It is about being with Him. It is about being transformed. It is about trusting Him and being changed bit by bit. And the author is saying, listen, it's not easy to be a follower of Christ, but look at who God is. Look at what he has done 
Remember the good news we heard, he says. That Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is God who created the world, who is greater than the angels, who is greater than Moses, who became human because of his love for you, who died because of his love for you, who was raised and is now at the right hand of his Father. The same right hand that, that Moses and the people of Israel sang when, when God rescued them through the Red Sea. Your powerful right hand did this. And Jesus is there exalted and glorified. And this is the good news. This is reality. <laughs> reality. That's up for grabs these days, isn't it? What is reality? What is really true when it comes to the COVID agenda? And what is really true about all these other things that are going on? We all have our perspectives on that. I don't know. But what I do know is the good news of Christ. And the question is, is have you received this good news? Have you received Jesus? He is not some person that, that you get to pick and choose which parts of him you will receive. He is the living God whose word means it is done. When he speaks, it is done. So be fearful, give attention to, so that none of you be found. Here, the word means seem, so that none of you, let me just write this, here for a second here, let's see here. This word found, none of you seem to have be seen, seem, 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 to have fallen short of it. The way it's written in there is it's 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 a it's a conditional thing. It's it's saying, please don't get to this place where you have fallen short of it. Guthrie writes, it suggests the ambiguity attached to an assessment of an individual member's spiritual state. Hughes writes, the author is intent on de demonstrating the possibility with the hope that in doing so he'll prevent it from becoming a reality. That within the community of faith there may be hypocrites or defectors whose position is one of unbelief rather than of faith. Externally, they may be members of the church, these people, but internally, in their heart, they are not belonging to God. And the writer says, listen, you've heard the good news just as, just as they did. They being the people of Israel. And, and, and what did they hear? What did the Israelites hear back then? Oh, man. We read it condensed into a very short few chapters, but it's pretty amazing what they heard. And actually, it wasn't that long a period of time that they experienced these things, that they heard the voice of God speak. Remember, the author of Hebrews says, in many ways he has spoken in the past, in various ways. Well, listen how he spoke to the nation of Israel. He spoke through Moses. He spoke through nine plagues. He spoke through the death of every firstborn male child in Egypt. He spoke through the passing of the Red through the Red Sea. He spoke through the drowning of the Egyptian army. He spoke through the provision of water and food. He spoke through the cloud that, that was before them and, and the pillar of fire at night. Through thunder and lightning at Mount Sinai, he spoke to the Ten Commandments. The, good, the Israelites had the good news preached to them in very concrete ways. Every morning they woke up and they saw, woke up and they saw that manna, and yes, it got tiring, but it was a more day-by-day -day demonstration of God's provision. And every night they saw the pillar of fight, flight, flight, the pure pillar of fire, and yes. 
that would have become common, and yet it was there, and in the daytime, there was a cloud to lead them. They had the very word of God in their midst. The good news that God had called them to be his people, that he was fulfilling his promise to him. But the message they heard was of no value. Why? Because they did not combine it with faith. They heard, but they did not trust. They heard God, but they did not trust God. They did not respond by saying, Wow, God is God, awesome, powerful, holy, and He has called us to be His people. That is amazing. I'll trust Him with my very life. I will know that He has good for me. I will obey Him. They didn't respond that way. Now, they did do it at one point in time in, in Exodus 14. They made this declaration as they came through the Red Sea in 1430 and 31. We read, That day the Lord saved Israel from the, hand of the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw, heard, in other words, heard God's actions in their scene, the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in Moses, in him, I should say, and in his Moses servant, in Moses, his servant. And then they gone on to, to, to sing this wonderful psalm that we read at the beginning of the service, and it, and it wasn't... Well, it says here, three days, three days in the desert before they complained and grumbled. It took them three days to get to the place where they forgot that God was their giver. Where it took them three days where instead of going to God and saying, Lord God, we need water. Can you please help us? We know you provided for us through this, and so we can trust you to provide water for us. They didn't do that. They just cut to the quick. They grumbled, and they said, why have you brought us out here to die? And in doing so, they showed that they did not trust. Now, in this time of persecution that the preachers, listeners were going through, a persecution that had them wondering, is Jesus who he said he was? They were like their ancestors did in the wilderness, pining for what they believed were easier days. Isn't it funny how that happens? How what was a difficult time in the past when we get into some other problems or difficulties in the present, those difficult times can seem so good. It's amazing how the, the Egyptians who never had a day off in Egypt, who were beaten, who were persecuted, who were treated harshly, who had to work long days, When they were without water, when they were without food, all they could think about is, well, at least we had leeks and onions. It's so good there. And so it was with these listeners of the preacher of Hebrews. The lure of returning them, themselves returning to the simple faith of the Jewish faith, of the faith without Jesus, seemed to draw them. And they forgot how the good news had transformed their lives, how Jesus had come. But there is hope. Because those who heard did not combine it with faith. That's the reason they fell. But we, having believed, enter the rest, just as God said, I vowed in my anger they will not enter my rest. We who have believed enter the rest. 
just as surely as those who did not believe did not enter God's rest. But what is the rest? Is it a reality now? Does it mean to go to heaven when I die? Is it something that will occur when Jesus returns? The answer is yes. It is summed up in the following. I have been saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. Scripture affirms all three of these. For we are in this time of what I've referred to in the past, and theologians speak of, and New Testament scholars speak of, the already and the not yet. That with Christ seated at the right hand of God, there is a sense in which there is already the kingdom of God here on this earth, but it is not yet fulfilled. And we live between these two times. So Paul can say, for by the grace you have been saved. For by grace, I should say, you have been saved. And then he can say elsewhere that we need to work in Philippians 2, we need to, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, or in 1 Corinthians 1.18, that we are being saved. But then he can say also in Romans 5.9 that we shall be saved. And it is because we are in this time of the already of having tasted the goodness of God, of tasted the salvation, and yet not fully experiencing it completely, wholly, that we are in this time, that this is where we have the opportunity to work out our salvation, to trust God. And ultimately, what this author is going to show us is to rest in him. Which we are going to pause here and finish the rest part next week, which I know some of you are saying, come on, Mark, seriously? Well, I'm pausing. I, I have been finding it hard to go through this text because, A, it's easy just to put this out there as it's you people. And, of course, I'm someone who wrestles with what this means for me first and foremost and have been wrestling with how does this, where in the areas of my life do I not trust God? Where do I not rest in Him? And so I want to invite us, and that's why I've been last week and, and this week, and, and just again, the sense of, as we come to the exhortation passage, we're going to keep coming back to them, but it's an opportunity for us to reflect. As George Guthrie said, the exhortation passages keep coming away, back to this idea of, of following away, of, of us going into sin, of, of punishment, of promise, the need to receive the message of God, the voice of God. Of faith, obedience, endurance, of entering in, of actually living out the faith that we proclaim in our lives. Come, whatever process, whatever thing we go through, will I trust God? So I want to continue to invite us to, to invite you to also to take these words seriously and ask God to search your heart. Where is His word? not being trusted in your life? Where is his word being pushed to the side? We all do it. We have no problem saying, oh, I'm good at this. I, I follow God in this area. But we ignore other areas of our lives that we don't want to explore. But here's the good news. The good news is that God is good and he only wants the best for us. And he doesn't ask us to do something to make fun of us or to, to, to ridicule us or to, to make 
for no purpose at all. He does it so that we may know him. Because he knows our creator God, our, the lover of our souls knows that when our hearts are fully and completely for him, then we are truly free. And not only that, but he also knows that, that this is what his plan was, that we, who have the Spirit of Christ within us, as we yield to that Spirit in our lives in every area, that we become the Spirit of Christ in this broken world. I don't know about you, but aren't you discouraged that people aren't coming to faith in our community? Don't you ever wonder why? What is it? God, what is it going to be? What do we need to do? And in order for the, the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ to come, I know there are people, I was talking to someone this week who's got all kinds of roadblocks because of church experience that has happened. And knows that somewhere along the way they have to deal with it. And one day we'll talk about it. Someone else who has all kinds of excuses, but their excuses that are always deflected onto what other people have done. Other Christians have done in the name of Jesus. Rather than taking responsibility for their own life. Oh, may we wake up. Lord God, may wake us up. Make me up. As the end of this passage says, your word is living and active. May that be so in our community. That the beauty and fragrance of Christ the saving hand of Christ may be made alive in our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Am I out? I'm out, right, Anna? Okay, cool. I'm wondering if we could just go into a time of prayer um, in response to some of the things I've said, and I don't know what you heard me say. It's always an interesting thing. Uh, but just to go into a time of prayer, whether it be a prayer of... of confession, a prayer of yearning, a prayer of um, praying for our community, but can we just come before this holy and awesome God? As we stand before him, the awesomeness of who he is, this holy mountain, Mount Sinai, as we stand before him, knowing that in his glory and splendor, as Christ is seated at the right hand of God in his glory and splendor, that we are to fear because this is awesome. Creator of heaven and earth has called you, has called me. But if we don't get a vision of what that looks like, of who he is and what he has done for us and that, that he still sees us and yearns for us, that we get excited about us, that we are his inheritance, as Paul said in Ephesians 1. So can we just spend some time in prayer? Um, just pray quietly, but we'd love it if you, some people would pray out loud, inviting God to come and, and, and
Lord, you are great and awesome and powerful. You are the one who is crowned with glory. You are worthy of great, greater honor. You are the builder of everything. Yeah, you are great and glorious. Your word is powerful. And yet, all through Hebrews, what I see is, yeah, we're told how incredible you are, how great you are, how far above us you are. And yet you care about us. You make practical gifts available to us. You you enable us and help us in in so many ways. And I thank you that your rest, your gospel and gifts are available to us now. They're still available. And um, we come before you and, and humbly say we love you and we want to follow you. Thank you that you are our creator, you are our high priest, and you are the giver of all good gifts, everything that we need, and you know us better than we know ourselves, and you love us more than anyone could love us, more than a mother can love a child. You love us. Your love is so, so big and so far-reaching, so deep. I am so glad that Jesus loves even me. And the other song I keep thinking of is sort of from Psalm 60, but it says, Through our God we shall do valiantly. It is he who has put down our enemies. So we'll sing and shout the victory. Christ is king. He's our king and he loves us. Thank you, God, that that is who you are and how you work in us. In Jesus' name. And from Psalm 145, Father, I pray that we would speak of the glorious honor of your majesty and of your wondrous works. I pray that we would speak of the might of your wonderful acts. I pray that we would declare your greatness. I pray that we would abundantly utter the memory of your great goodness. Thy righteous shall seek and shall find it. You, Lord, are gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. You, Lord, are good to all, and your tender mercies are over all your servants. All your servants shall give you thanks, O Lord, and thy saints shall praise thee. I pray that we would speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your might and your glorious and the glorious majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. You, Lord, are faithful in your words and righteous in all your works.